Um, I'd like to welcome you all, but of course, most of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Jay Hunt. Before we begin properly, let's just remind ourselves briefly of how Jay Hunt got to where she is today. Her broadcasting career took off in news at BBC, where she made a rapid rise to become, first of all, editor of the one o'clock news and then on to the six o'clock. She moved on from that to become head of BBC Daytime. Then in 2007, she joined Five for a very short spell. And then she was tempted back by the Beeb to be controller of BBC One. Then David Abram came calling and Jay began 2011 as the new chief creative officer of Channel 4. She inherited a programming budget of 450 million and added Channel 4's digital channels to her portfolio too. Although this is Jay's second TV festival as controller of Channel 4, last time she hadn't been in the job long enough to shoulder too much responsibility for what was on screen. Not so this time around, Jay. Um, last month in Broadcast Hot 100, they announced Jay as the second most powerful commissioner in British television. Um, so before we show you Channel 4's showreel, um, Jay, how does it feel to come second to Stuart Murphy? <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. It's a very creative man and a great commissioner, so I'm fine with that. Really? Yeah, really. <laughs> um, I was told that you were seen, and I must get to the bottom of this, you were seen in Broadcasting House around about the time that they were boarding for Director General I mean, job. honestly... Did, did, you, did you make a pitch for it? No, I absolutely categorically didn't. In fact, I will, I will embarrass my lovely head of press, James, who said to me, I've told them you didn't. I saw what you were wearing. You definitely wouldn't go on to interview in that. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually very, very hurtful. But um, no, I, I categorically didn't. And I've never seen a story develop a momentum based on absolutely nothing. I had been at my desk literally all day and it became this sort of ridiculous media storm. So no, I categorically didn't. Uh, and being the woman you are then, why didn't you? Because honestly, I mean, you know, this will sound a bit kind of crawly, but I have become almost religious in my uh, love of Channel 4. I think it's an extraordinary place to go. It's a place which says, let's stand up and be counter. We're about creativity. We're about innovation. We're about doing things differently. We're about changing the world. We're about having a view on the way in which Britain is evolving. And I think it's very hard to describe what a hugely liberating place that is to be after the other places I've worked in my career. And, and I absolutely love it. And I've started a job and I want to finish it. Not counting out in the future, though, DG. I honestly, I promise you, I've got absolutely no plans to go back to the BBC at any point in the future. I mean, I am sitting at Channel 4, I've got a fantastic job and I want to do that. That was a lovely politician's answer. So it's, before not, it's not a politician, oh, honestly, honestly, seriously, seriously. I mean, I've been, as I'm sure many people remember, I have been in difficult situations on this platform at various points in my career, but this is utterly clear cut. Okay. Um, before we go to more questions then, let's take a little look at what you're offering at Channel 4 right now. So Jay, does that uh, channel output feel like one that you own now? Yes, I mean, I think I'm, I look at that and it makes me smile because I just think there's an extraordinary range there. And I think you look at things like Grayson this year, completely reinterpreting what arts coverage can look like on Channel 4, Midnight Beasts who've come up through YouTube and have now become part of the E4 culture. And I think there's, to me, that is a, a tape which talks about innovation and about doing things in a different sort of way. And I think one of the things that's been exciting for me is it feels that this year we are beginning to get a new generation of hit shows coming down the line. I mean, two thirds of our highest rating shows this year have been brand new titles. And I was brought in to lead a process of creative renewal and the fact that we've got there we certainly haven't finished but we've started in the right sort of way in 18 months is something I'm very proud of. Uh, you've gone on record I think as, as saying that you know it is really the most difficult channel to run because you don't have a lot of those building blocks that the other certainly of course BBC One and ITV those channels um, have. Do you feel like you wake up every day and you have to start again every day? There's an element of that. Yeah. <laughs> I think no, you don't think of it in quite those terms, but it's certainly true that other channels that have got great big blocks of soap have building blocks in a way that we don't. But, you know, in one sense, that is a, is a pain. In another sense, it's a huge creative opportunity because what it actually means is that we can do an extraordinary array of different things. And I think one of the reasons that we've launched the 47 channel, for example, recently is because it's very clear to us when you look at audience behaviour that people know that there's always something new and different on Channel 4 and they wanted another chance to see it. So, in a sense, that economic model is also incredibly freeing because we could and we do do whatever we want in that sense. We're not restricted in scheduling terms in the way you sometimes are in other channels. A lot of people here, of course, will be very interested in, in what it is you want to see commissioned, what it is you want to see land on your commissioner's desks. Do you have a sort of overarching vision for the channel where you think, if I could define it as anything, I would define it as this? Definitely. I mean, I think what's extraordinary about Channel 4 is it occupies this unique space where we pride ourselves on doing things differently and we pride ourselves on having a view on the world. And I think those two flavours, mixed with the sort of irreverence and mischief that you can see in our entertainment and comedy, really encapsulate what Channel 4 is there to do. And I think 
You know, in a funny sort of way, I don't know how many people in this room have watched I'm Spasticus, which is on air now, but in microcosm, I think that absolutely epitomises what's extraordinary about Channel 4. No other broadcaster would have four disabled comedians and writers doing a sketch show which makes fun of able-bodied people and put it on four nights of a week in the run-up to the Paralympics. I mean, it's an out there thing to do. It's about backing new talent and doing things fundamentally different from what anyone else would do. And I think that that's an extraordinary thing that four can do that nobody else can. Let's talk for a minute about the Paralympics then, a little bit about sport on Channel 4. Yeah. It starts it's next Wednesday, I think yeah. it, it starts. We'll talk in a minute about the very punchy ad campaign that you started running off the back of the Olympics. But it surely is going to be very difficult for Channel 4 to come on air after the huge success that was the BBC's coverage of the Olympics? Well, I think it's only very difficult. I mean, you know, huge credit to the BBC. They did a fantastic job. But at the end of the day, these are two very, very different events. I mean, the Paralympics have been going since the 60s. It's got a smaller number of sports. It's got fewer countries uh, participating. It is a very different event. And I think what we are trying to do is to fundamentally reinvent the way in which the Paralympics is covered. So we've got 400% increase in the coverage that the BBC had in 2008, 500 hours of coverage. I mean, we have put it right across the main channel schedule and I think there are two things going on there one is we want to have absolutely compelling elite sport shown to the nation but I think the channel fourness of it and the bit I think we've been really excited about is what if we could play a part in making this nation feel and other nations feel more at ease with disability I mean that is an unbelievably Channel 4 place to get to. So not only will we have all those hours of coverage, but next week, and this is something I'm thrilled to bits about, we'll be launching the careers of eight new disabled presenters and reporters, people who two years ago had never been on television, who've been training nearly as hard as the Paralympians and will be a defining part of what we bring to the Paralympics. So I, I think it's, I mean, the whole channel is on tenterhooks because it's a really exciting moment for us to do something that could have lasting impact, I think. Uh, the marketing of it, the thanks for the warm-up uh, posters, have, I mean, just entirely anecdotally, have entirely split people that I know. I personally thought they were brilliant, they make me smile and I see, I see what you're getting at. But a lot of people thought, you know, that's pretty snooty coming from a channel that, that uh, you know, by most people's estimation, did not do a good job on the World Athletics Championships last year. Yeah, but I mean, you know, get a sense of humour. I mean, at the end of the day, I think, you know, Channel 4 is defined by doing things that are witty and that are mischief-making and are irreverent. I mean, if anyone honestly read that and thought, well, that's a bit snooty, I'm genuinely surprised. Uh, I think the whole spirit of what we've done with the marketing, and I don't take any credit for that, Dan Brook and the marketing team do, is about saying, let's be bold in the way that we position this sport. So that the trail, which I think is one of the most exceptional pieces of work I have ever seen, goes to dark places and deals with disability in a way that nobody else would deal with. And I think, you know, thanks for the warm-up, is exactly what it's meant to be, couldn't be more ch Channel 4. It's a tongue-in-cheek way of saying, you know, that's been great, let's continue this amazing British summer of sport with the Paralympics now. So, you know, I think, I think that's fine. I don't think we need to be defensive about that at all. Uh, is Claire Balding doing some of the presenting? Yeah. Right. Is she giving you and your channel advice about how to get it right? No, I, don't, I, think, I think she would find that slightly patronising, actually. No, I don't, I don't think so at all. I mean, Claire... In fact, I saw Claire earlier in the week and we were talking about how we caught up at the end of 2008 and we talked then about what she'd brought to the Olympics and Paralympics coverage. And, you know, what I'm utterly thrilled about is she's an exceptional broadcaster. We booked her to do that and indeed to come across and, and present the rating for us long before she became the golden presenter of the Olympics. Uh, it's fantastic. It's been a real coming of age for her and there's a really palpable sense that she has been the star of the Olympics and how lucky for us then to have her as part of our coverage. What about the horse racing then? You've just won the rights from the BBC. How, how central can sport be? be at a channel like Channel 4 in terms of, of course, budget, because if you're using budget for sports and you have to use a lot of budget for sport, then somebody else loses. Yeah, but I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are various points when, um, you know, great big sports, whether it's football, the Olympics come around and say, are you in or are you out? And I just sort of laugh quietly to myself and think, well, well obviously we're not in. But equally, what's been interesting, I think, is looking at some of the smaller sports beginning to think, well, OK, what sort of commercial partnership do we want to have with a broadcaster? What would it be like to be uniquely in partnership with one particular broadcaster? And that's certainly what racing thought. And sometimes those opportunities will come up. I mean, it was sort of the worst kept secret in, uh, in broadcasting land that we made a sort of plucky bid for Formula One. And I think occasionally when those opportunities come up and critically we think we've got something creatively to add to it, then we'll have the conversation. But it will never be the mainstay of Channel 4. It's not what it's there to do. OK, let's talk for a minute then uh, about share. How are you going to keep David Abraham happy? 6.8% was your share in 2011. Um, year to year results show right now it's at 6.6. Crucially, it needs to be 7. How are you going to get your 7? Well, it doesn't crucially need to be seven. I, mean, I think seven is an ambitious target and always has been. I mean, I think I'll, I'll put it a slightly different way. We ended 2011 in a better position competitively than any other public service broadcaster. Now, that in itself is pretty striking. But when you then say what happened to Channel 4 last year was tantamount to taking Corrie off ITV or EastEnders off BBC One when we you know, chose to let Big Brother go, 
to say that with all of that, the impact is that the channel, the main channel's gone down 0.2 of a percent, I think is an extraordinary achievement and huge credit to some of the commissioners in the room and the Channel 4 team for managing to deliver that. So, you know, I think the challenge for us is to keep on making content that audiences love. And that's why I'm excited that we're beginning to get new shows coming through that people are watching in large volume. What about choosing to let Big Brother go? I mean, that was a decision clearly that was yeah. made before your tenure, but it was made, and now we've seen Channel 5 having big success with it. They've just renewed it until is it 2014, I think, mm. they've renewed it until... It would be better, wouldn't it, if you'd, if you'd had it for another couple of years? Honestly, honestly not. I mean, I think I sat in exactly this chair and said this last year, but it remains true now that, you know, I wouldn't have come to Channel 4 if we had Big Brother. I mean, I think it's, it's great that it's done what it's done for five, but if four is about anything, it's about letting things go and growing new ideas. And I think there comes a point when you have to be brave enough to say, OK, fine, it's still doing the numbers, but is it really channel defining in the way you need it to be? And it wasn't. And I think it was absolutely the right decision. And even on the darkest days, I can honestly say I haven't once thought I wish we had Big Brother, not once. And I don't think I ever will, because what that's allowed us to do is make Black Mirror, commission undateables, end up with Grayson on screen talking about arts and you know that huge dividend of money which is up for grabs for everybody in this room has gone into a whole new range of genres and allowed us to do things we just couldn't do before. But what then about the, that key demographic, so 16 to 34, those yeah. people who are really interested in Big Brother who you have lost and are losing as a result, how do you get them back? What programmes do you want to commission, do you want to see on the channel that you think will convince them to tune in? Well, I think they're great. I mean, there are moments when I just think, isn't it interesting how you can shift the dial here? So if you look at something like Gordon Behind Bars, for example, which was doing a 22 share of 16 to 34s, or even more strikingly, during our Channel 4 Goes Mad season, a season about mental health. It doesn't get much more public service than that. We are outperforming Big Brother at 10 o'clock with the world's maddest interview. So in a sense, I think that what's been really exciting is realising you can find quite different sorts of content and get really sizable young audiences to come to. It's also true that comedy is a big driver of it and things like the funny fortnight are important for us in terms of courting young audiences. We could do with more big entertainment, certainly. But I think the success we've had this year with big factual entertainment shows, whether it's Undateables or Bradford, really demonstrate you can bring young audiences to different sorts of content. And what about bringing more men? I mean, right now, your channel attracts more women than men. I think I've got the figure here. Was it 56.7% of women, 43.3% of men? What do you do about that? Well, that's, you know, to be honest, that's fairly standard fare and telly skews female mainly anyway. So, I mean, that, that is not unique to Channel 4. I mean, I think the issue with men is something that I picked up from my time at Five. I think there is absolutely an opportunity. If any more Channel 4 commissioners or former Channel 4 commissioners want to sit on the stage, and there's plenty of room. Um, uh, um, one of the things I picked up from Five is that there was a real opportunity to serve male viewers. And I think, you know, some of the shows we've got coming up this autumn, whether it's Guy Martin or Kevin, who's uh, building a rather extraordinary uh, construct in his garden or some of the slightly more male skewing drama we've got so for example fantastic piece uh, that Peter Mullen is starring in for us called The Fear which is a Brighton gangster film is much darker than quite a lot of Channel 4 drama and I think we'll probably bring in male viewers as well that's not a priority I mean we like all commercial channels need to deliver young audiences and upmarket audiences but we also need to maintain enough volume to have the sort of critical mass you need to be a public service broadcaster. In the good old days Channel 4 just really had to worry about BBC 2 and now you've got to worry about Channel 5 who occasionally beat you, you've got to worry about ITV 2 who occasionally beat you. Um, what programmes do you see, and I know you will try and avoid answering this question, understandably, <laughs> but what programmes do you watch? What programmes have they commissioned recently that you think, shit, I wish we'd done that? No, I won't try and avoid answering that at all. I mean, I think it's the worst kept secret if anyone is surprised by this. I mean, Celeb Juice is a great show, definitely, definitely. I think, you know, ITV2 have done really well with that. Good on them. Hand on heart, and I love Jeff to bits, but there isn't anything on Channel 5 that I wish we had. I genuinely isn't. And if you look at Channel 5's success, it's seven out of their top ten programmes are Big Brother. So we had that. We chose to let it go. They've still got a way to go to have a big track record in terms of really good original content. But he buys some great acquisitions. So, honestly, there isn't... I mean, I... I don't think there's a hell of a lot on any other channel at the moment that we desperately want. Um, and that's not avoiding the answer. I just don't think that there is. On Sky? No. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure I believe you. There's nothing well, you would get... Well, I almost put that over to the floor. I mean, you know, I think those channels are doing a different sort of job. Okay. I mean, Stuart's doing a great job, but he's got a completely different... Uh, focus. We are delivering public service content uh, that is serving commercial demographics, that is compelling and that audiences want to watch, but it's got a particular tone of voice. And that mischief making, that irreverence, that willingness to punch authority on the nose, that is quite unique to Channel 4. So actually, when you look across the landscape, there aren't lots of shows that I think you'd say, well, I'll pick that up and bring that across, because there just aren't. Drugs Live. I read, I read about it and yeah. now I've seen nothing of it. Yeah. Where is it and what's happening with it? Well, I joked with a few people about this. I've been very tempted at various points to make a show called The Making of Drugs Live. I mean, <laughs> um, 
you know, in a funny sort of way, I can't think of a more Channel 4 commission. I mean, half a million people a year are quite regularly taking ecstasy, and yet we culturally don't feel able to have a conversation about what the physiological impact of that is. So there doesn't seem a more Channel 4 area for us to go into, particularly something that disproportionately affects young people. So it will air this autumn. I mean, it's been quite a journey getting there, and I think what we've realised along the way is quite how many invested stakeholders there are. We've had to get it past an ethics committee. We've had to get it past home office licences. Um, it will be slightly different in terms of the shape from where we started with it, but it will be going into the schedule in the next couple of months. What, what parts of it have you ditched? What parts of it did they object well, to? Well, we have ended up in a situation where we had quite a stark editorial decision. We could have persisted with the idea of taking lo- drugs live in the studio. The downside of that is, and it was explained to us through working clearly with Professor Nutt on this, the former drug czar, is that we, if we couldn't blind test it, then we wouldn't get a proper result. So we've ended up with quite a lot of that on VT, but there will be a live discussion about the outcome and looking at really what the impact of those drugs have been on these individuals. We've got Lionel Shriver rather brilliantly under the influence of MDMA. We've got a female vicar doing the same thing. We've got Keith Allen involved in it as well. So it's a brilliantly weird and eclectic bunch of people dealing with a really serious issue. Um, Let's talk for a moment. You've mentioned it a couple of times, the undateables. Do you think, although it has been, you know, a critically very well received show, and it did probe areas that, you know, I would say were mm-hmm. unique to television, where television had not gone gone before, do you think the title of the Undateables was disrespectful to the participants? No, I don't think it was disrespectful, and quite obviously we discussed it with the participants and they were perfectly happy with it being called that. I mean, I think one of the things that Channel 4 has, I think, an extraordinary track record in doing is is using titling and marketing to bring audiences to a subject that they wouldn't otherwise watch. And I think both that show and Bradford managed to do something rather extraordinary. If you'd said to the audience of producers we've got here, Channel 4 will air a show about disabled people, three million people will watch it, a huge young audience will come to it and will come back to it week after week, people wouldn't have believed you. And I think you know that titling, which is quite out there was certainly part of getting an audience to sample that but I was watching it go out and looking at Twitter I don't know if anyone else did this and you could see attitudes changing while it was on air and to me it doesn't get any more channel for than that to see someone saying I didn't realize that's what Asperger's is or oh my god I think I know someone who's got autism or is that how Downs affects people and actually watch attitudes change is what Channel 4 is there to do. So you don't think there is a degree of tension then quite often? I mean, quite often when one watches Channel 4 programmes that have obviously been, you know, carefully crafted, participants themselves have, you can see, been nursed lovingly through a very difficult process of having a camera stuck in their face at their Mm. most vulnerable moments. Mm. That takes a lot of work on the production side. Then so often you have this very punchy marketing machine that goes out there and sells it in a different way. And, and evidence there by you saying people watched, started watching it on Twitter, probably attracted by the marketing, probably because they thought they were going to see something else. That's, that, there's a bit of a slip between, betwixt cup and lip there, isn't no, there? No, I, d- I don't think there is, because I think you know, in some respects this is also a greater good argument. From my point of view, to have got three million people to watch a programme about disability and to come away better informed, I mean, they were extraordinary pieces, incredibly difficult to make, and they did something important. And I think part of what Channel 4 is there to do is to be quite controversial in some of the decisions that it makes about its programming. And I think the positioning of that show was absolutely right. So you think whatever you have to do within the boundaries of (laughs) certain boundaries, whatever you have to do to get them through the door, you'll do? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think that's a kind of insane place you've got to. I don't don't think that at all. I mean, on no level can you say that you you do whatever you want to get an audience. What I'm saying is on this occasion, with the buy-in of the contributors, we called the show The Undateables, it got a sizable audience to look at content in a way that they wouldn't have done otherwise. And I think on that particular occasion, with those caveats and those contributors happy to be part of it and other charities involved happy to be part of it, I feel relaxed about that decision. Mencap, you'll be aware of this, criticised what they call the sensational marketing for reinforcing, and I'm going to quote directly, negative, unflattering stereotypes positioning disabled people as being different. Did you talk to them directly after that criticism, or what do you make of it? Oh, no, I didn't talk to Mencap directly after that, but I probably wouldn't have done in a situation like that, simply because it had been handled by somebody else. But I think, what do I think about that? I think that when we do shows that are about um, communities, there will be stakeholders who have different views. That happens all the time. And I think when I look at our track record in disability, whether it's the mental health season, what we're doing with the Paralympics, what we're doing, giving opportunities to disabled comedians and writers in the way I discussed with I'm Spasticus, then I think we should be very proud of it. You know, even something like Katie Piper coming to the fore on Channel 4, developed through documentary, is now one of the most important presenters on our feature slate, but she's not going to be presenting disability programming, she's presenting programming about beauty. That's as good as it gets. That's about a channel that's commitment is such that it wants to defy stereotypes and do something really bold. And I think in the round, we're getting it right. 
So the Undateables then, I mean, it was very well received. It was seen as being a sort of landmark piece of programming for Channel 4. What, what about The Hoarder Next Door? It, didn't, it strikes me that did not go so smoothly. What, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think The Hoarder Next Door is a very different piece. It's not trying to achieve quite the same level of impact. It's not trying to change attitudes in the same way. It's a programme that audiences greatly enjoyed. And I think, again, with a lot of those contributors, who, uh, some of whom had low-level mental health problems, we dealt with it incredibly sensitively. So you know, in the mix of what we do, not everything will be out there trying to change the world. To be honest, it gets a bit, gets a bit tiring. I <laughs> think every slot on Channel Four has got a big agenda that we're trying to change the world. Yeah. But I think you know that was compelling programming that audiences enjoyed, and I think we should be proud of it. You don't make any secret of of taking responsibility for decisions. You know, you're up there and you do take criticism on the chin. Is there any part of the creative process that is off limits to you? <laughs> um, it's funny, my um, head of scheduling from BBC One is here, George Dixon, who now works with me, and uh, he always used to say to me on BBC One, it's your name over the door, Peggy, which um, for EastEnders fans, uh, they'll appreciate what that means. Uh, and he's sort of right. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, if it's on Channel 4, then it's on my watch, and I should be aware of it, and I should be across it, because it'd be a bit strange if I weren't to be. But the important thing is that's a very different thing from going out to indies and saying, look, we want a diversity of view. And I think, you know, we were, I can't tell you how chuffed we were, and thank you for the people who, who voted for us on this, to see us topping the broadcast poll as the best broadcaster to deal with for the first time in six years, I think demonstrates the opposite end of that spectrum, which is we are trying really, really hard to talk to a huge array of new suppliers to get different sorts of people through the door. Because I don't own Channel 4, it's about everybody in this room who wants to shape it to be something really precious. And I think, it's all about that diversity of view. It's not about my view. Well, I, me I mentioned at the start when I introduced you this broadcast list of the 100, 100 most powerful people. You uh, reached number two in that. And, and it said, um, with her hands on style and direct feedback, Channel 4's output is shaped by her attention to the smallest detail. Where do you think hands on style and direct feedback starts to become micromanaging? I think it does when it's, when it's not welcome and it's not collaborative and it's not making things better. I mean, at the end of the day, I have one of the most exceptional team of commissioners I have ever, ever worked with. They all have their own view. They're at Channel 4 because they're creative people in their own right. They are, they are the main point of contact with the indie sector. But I absolutely have to have some responsibility around quality. I can't just sit there and say, well, that went out on my watch and I didn't know about it. So my, my primary view is that I should, I should get involved in very little in terms of the day-to-day. -day. But of course, there'll be points when stuff's referred to me, I'm asked to look at something, I'm asked what my view is, and I will get involved then. But, you know, we have great commissioners in place who work collaboratively with indies to make great content. That's the model, and I'm very respectful of that. Right. And you wouldn't... You see, I think of where you were grown, which was in newsrooms and being editors in newsrooms. Now, I know every editor I ever worked with in newsroom was, would directly pick up the phone to the live gallery and scream down it if things weren't going right. That's not your mode anymore? Are you somebody who stands much further back Actually, than that? I always run a very quiet gallery, I like to think. <laughs> but, um, um, no, I mean, you know, crikey. I mean, most of the people in this room who supply Channel 4 will know occasionally, yes, I'll pick up the phone to them. I mean, why wouldn't I? It'd be a bit weird if I was sitting there in my ivory tower not having conversations day to day with suppliers. I mean, I spend most of my days meeting indies, talking to people about ideas, sitting in routines with my team, talking about what we might do next. But, you know, I have to provide some sort of leadership. That's what I was brought in to do. But at the end of the day, there's huge delegated authority at Channel 4. Uh, there are people with very strong idea of what they want to do. And one of the things I say repeatedly, and in fact, I was talking about this morning, is if I made shows that only I liked, it'd be a very odd channel. I'm typical of almost nobody. So I spend most of my life <laughs> trying to pretend and think into the minds of what other people might like. And, and I think that's what you need to do as a channel controller. OK, let's talk bigger, fatter, gypsier now. Um, just before we do talk about it, let's remind ourselves of one of the highlights. Did you say that's not Gypsy Weddings, actually, if anybody wondered? <laughs> no. No, I'm serious. That isn't. That's a show called Gypsy Blood, which is a different show altogether. OK. Um, the two top shows then in 2011 were Gypsy Weddings, 9.7 million, 33% share. Uh, Gypsy Christmas, 7.2%. The top show of 2012 is Gypsy Weddings, 7.2%. And the documentary Gypsy Blood, you were saying that, that was a clip from that, is uh, in the top 20 in 2012 with 3 million. How much more Gypsy stuff can your viewers take? <laughs> I think, I, think, I think we've quite naturally got to a point where we're starting to think differently about that franchise. I mean, Thelma's Gypsy Girls, which has just been on, was a very, very different way into that community, looking at feminism, looking at how they, you get Gypsy Girls to a point where they have an opportunity to get an education and to work if they want to. So I think we've already evolved where we are in that space. There will be some more Gypsy Weddings next year. We're doing some specials. We're not doing another series. And I think 
entirely for creative reasons that will then reach the end of the line. I mean, there comes a point when I think you need to move on from these things. And, you know, big, big audiences like that on Channel 4 can be addictive. I think it's very important to know when to draw the line, and I think we're close to drawing the line. Okay. Uh, there's a big difference, isn't there, between celebrating a culture and having a quiet snigger at it. Do you think any of the, that genre crossed the line? I think they started from a joyful place. I mean, I, I arrived when that was a well-established franchise. So, um, and I think at the end of the day, what it's managed to do is to shine a light on a community that frankly never got on television and was actually largely overlooked. And it, it's a complex and diverse community with different views from the, the Romany gypsies to the Irish travellers. And it's a difficult community to work with for that reason. But I think their shows that Channel 4 rightly identified a seam that an audience was interested in. The programmes have been very respectful and have gone to quite dark places. They've looked at domestic violence and the rights of women. Um, and, but as I say, I think there will come a point when it's time to move on. Do you think the communities themselves have been left better off by the exposure that they've been under? I think, as I say, it's an incredibly disparate community and you'll find pockets that think one thing and pockets that think another about that. OK. Um, a lot of your successes have been sh short-run shows, not, not the one we've just been talking about. The next generation, then, of fact entertainment shows, where do they come from? Are they commissioned yet? Or what do you see them being? I mean, I think at the end of the day, this has been a period of transition at Channel 4. And I, in my view, we're sort of, I don't know, one third of the way through that in that we're entering a phase now where we've got returnable series. Many of them have been in short runs because we're experimenting. But the next phase is getting to a point when you have got runs of 14. I mean, I sit there seeing the commissioning editor for 24 hours in A&E, for example. I mean, that's an extraordinary show for us, delivers massive audiences and is commissioned in big blocks of 14. So we've already got some of those next generation of hits coming through. Um, but the ambition, I think, will not only be to have documentaries doing that sort of volume, will be to get our factual entertainment to a bigger scale. We're experimenting this autumn, for example, with Hotel Britannia, which is a hugely ambitious piece for the idea if Channel 4 ran a hotel, it would probably be the best hotel in the world, starring lots of our big Channel 4 faces, and we're excited about the possibility of that sort of franchise. Um, we've got other big titles coming up this autumn. We've got a new series with Jamie and Jimmy, which I think has got potential to go quite a long way as well. So we're sowing the seeds now. I think it would be mad for us to be commissioning 22 episodes of something sight unseen, but we're landing the sorts of shows which are beginning to cut through and will be coming back in volume. Um, TV so often these days can be a very low down and dirty business. We're going to watch a clip now. So I have to warn people, I haven't seen this clip. You might want to look away. Um, it's from Embarrassing Bodies. Oh. <laughs> and I wondered why they wouldn't show it to me uh, before we, we started. Um, what do you think of that clip we just saw? Can I just say thank you? I mean, you know, there are many hours of embarrassing bodies I'd have been proud to have seen, but that one, just in that little context. Um, I mean, I think Embarrassing Bodies, Hand on Heart, is an extraordinary programme. I'm not just saying that. Those people who work with me at BBC One will bear me out on this. I looked on it with envy when that show launched. I think we've done a running total of uh, what we have saved the NHS as a result of that programme, and it is well into the hundreds of thousands of pounds. And extraordinary though it may seem to you, it is true that people will go on to Embarrassing Bodies and Embarrassing Bodies Live and take medical advice and seek treatment and be cured and move on with their lives. These are the same people who won't go to their GP. Go figure. I don't understand it either. But they do. And I think if we can find an area like health where we can make a real difference, we can accompany it with completely compelling online content. And Embarrassing Bodies Live, to me, was groundbreaking this year to find a way in which you can use Skype technology to diagnose people. I mean, I wish I could take all of you to see the setup that Maverick have got in Birmingham, a studio built into a hospital with a huge back room of people making connections between people who need diagnosis and treatment and medical practitioners. is an extraordinary thing. So I accept that that particular image doesn't look that promising, but uh, <laughs> it's a really important franchise, I think, for us. Not for him personally, anyway. Um, extraordinary People has had hum some success on, on Channel 5. How... how I mean, I know you would contend that it's not low down and dirty, but the, you know these are pretty shock tactics to get people in. How low down and dirty will you go? I don't think it's low down and dirty at all. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, this is a, this is a program which doles out industrial quantities of excellent health advice. I mean, I say you only have to look at the huge success we've had online with these brands and the massive peaks there are to see that people are using this program to diagnose conditions they're not prepared to go to a doctor to see. I don't think that is in any way down and dirty. As I say, I think it's it is the absolute epitome of great public service television. We bring an audience to it, but it's doing a really important job. What about the, the amount of, of press coverage that's often whipped up by shows like that? When you see it happening, is it something that you at Channel 4 sort of collectively lick your lips at and think, yeah, that's just what we want? Well, no, actually, I mean, that show doesn't particularly attract press coverage. I mean, I think 
you know, at the end of the day, I think that Channel 4 has a role in, in stimulating a national conversation about big issues. I do think that. We should be an agent for change on big issues. We can be, and we can take more risks than other broadcasters too. But I don't think anyone sits there thinking, oh, zippity doo da day, we've made the front page of the mail. I mean, it's not that type of mindset. Um, these, uh, you, you do a lot of these, I mean, very controversially titled sort of one-offs. I've got notes of some of them here. Um, actually, this one's run very recently. Sex Story, Fifty Shades of Grey, Sex Lives and Rinsing Guys, My Phone Sex Secrets, My Big Fat Fetish, My Daughter the Teenage Nudist. Um, do you think they damage the Channel 4 brand? Not at all. I, I wonder how many people in this room saw any of those shows, because I would stand by every single one of them. My Phone Sex Secrets was one of the best documentaries I've seen this year. It was absolutely exceptional. I mean, it was a beautiful piece of modern, popular documentary talking about the way in which women were owning the sex industry and making good incomes from themselves from behind twitching curtains in various bits of Surbiton. I mean, I think it was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a really good doc. So I think it's a bit of an old trick to sort of read off titles and go, well, we shouldn't really be in that space. Channel 4 has always had sex programming. I think when you do it with a bit of wit and intelligence, and actually all of those shows to varying degrees did something rather more than that, which is they said, this is how our attitudes to sex are changing. I think there'd be quite a lot of other channels that wish they'd been quick quick off the mark as we were with Fifty Shades. International publishing phenomenon. Of course you'd want to be in that space if you're a broadcaster. Um, I did try to watch Sex, Lies and Rinsing Guys yesterday. Disappointing that you've taken yeah. off 4OD. I don't yeah, know Yeah, but again, is. I don't know if anybody watched that show. It was quite extraordinary. I have never seen anything like it. It was about women who have, who have set out overtly to make a life out of getting men to donate presents. A real phenomenon. I certainly was completely oblivious to it. Uh, it's an easier way of making money, I suspect. But... Um, I think, you know, when we can do that and lift the lid on behaviours that people didn't know about, then I don't think we should make any apology for doing that. Let's talk a bit now about, about um, growing uh, talent. What, what's your policy on that? Is there, I mean, interesting, actually, when you were talking about the, uh, the Paralympics, you're saying that you have very deliberately, did you say it's taken two years to sort of, you've, you talent spotted people and then what did you do? You, you... No, it's, I mean, we refer to it rather, uh, um, uns uh, it's a, not a great word, but they went to what we call boot camp yeah. and uh, we recruited them. Uh, they had to do a presentation to Channel 4 and uh, Channel 4 spent £600,000 training eight people who'd never been on television before to give them their first big break. I mean, wow. I think that's a pretty extraordinary thing to be able to sit here and say. More generally, I mean, we've grown a huge array of new talent. One of the amazing things about when you see the funny fortnight on air now, I've certainly forgotten how many comedians started their career at Channel 4. They might well have gone on to other things. We've got Harry Hill back on the channel tonight, which I'm delighted about, who of course started on Channel 4 as well. So I think our relationship with new talent is as important as it's ever been. I'm thinking because, I mean, recently, it's, it's of course what, true what you say, especially when it comes to comedy, I think Channel 4 in so many ways was pioneering, even from the very beginning in terms of uh, comics. But recently, people like Ruth Watson, Heston Blumenthal, Mary Portis, Hilary Davy have all been growing elsewhere. Hilary Davy herself, I think, has just signed an exclusive contract mm -hmm. with the channel. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that it is less of a place now to, to grow talent than it once was? Definitely not. I mean, I think in this sense, it's sort of the old Channel 4 chestnut. There are two sides to this. I mean, I would say back to that, look at Dave Fishwick, who we've just, uh, there have been such extraordinary broadcast interest in Dave since he did Bank of Dave, equally Mr. Drew and Mr. Goddard from Educating Essex, <coughs> Kayvan, who started his career on Channel 4. So there's, there's just just as long a list of people who are new and are growing into a role at Channel 4. I think the interesting thing is, quite a lot of times we will get talent from other channels who want to come across, sometimes, if I'm honest, because they think it gives us a new creative lease of life or a chance to do things in a different way, sometimes because they're looking for greater creative freedom and commercial freedom than they can have at the BBC. But in the vast majority of cases, we don't pursue those conversations. I think we have a really golden rule at Channel 4, which I'm very proud of, which is if we haven't got a great idea for somebody, then we don't pursue the conversation because we haven't got anything to add. So, okay. you know, someone like Hillary, for example, we've got two or three new shows, including one which will air next year called Hillary DeVay's Doll Office, where she goes back to look at what beverage was really all about and what would happen to the benefit system now if people had to live under that regime. And it's not quite as obvious as you might think. Some people would be much better off. So, you know, we've got those sorts of ideas that take her into a different sort of direction, that show her in a new light, and people are attracted by that. And I think when we can say, here's a completely new way of thinking of yourself as a presenter, come across and do interesting things, then people come. But quite often, we don't see the conversation. What do you think makes a, a good Channel 4 face? I don't think there is a good Channel 4 face. I mean, I think if there were to be, then we'd have sort of a huge homogeneity across the schedule. And I think what's interesting about the people that we employ is that they are strong flavours who have big personalities and lots of attitude, and they're, and they're not frightened of making a bit of trouble. And I think those sorts of people um, we welcome with open arms because there's an opportunity for them to do something exciting. Um, let's 
revisit actually a Channel 4 face who, uh, as far as I know, you, you, you stood by him this year. He had to weather a lot of uh, controversy. Um, Jimmy Carr, a, a clip pertaining to him, if we've got that. The Jimmy Carr scandal then, a, a help or a, or a hindrance, do you think, to the channel? I mean, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy is not uh, an exclusive uh, talent on Channel 4. He pops up on all sorts of channels. But I would say, I think uh, I'm interested you show that clip because having survived uh, Jonathan Ross coming back to BBC One, this is in a similar vein, uh, is a real test of what you are as a channel when you are putting somebody in the middle of a crisis onto a programme like that. And I don't know how many people saw that episode of Cats, but it was astonishing because he took it on the chin for the entire hour. Uh, the comedians played the game. I felt that we'd done a fantastic job in airing the issues. And then we moved on. And to me, that's exactly how we should have dealt with a situation like that. OK, let's move on now to uh, the channel looking for some sort of defining entertainment uh, programme. You said in May of this year that standout comedy and big entertainment hits are the hardest thing to find. They are market failure genres in lots of ways. To unpack that a bit. What does that mean? Well, I think, you know, one of the, it's interesting to see people beginning to invest in comedy again, but it's been a very, very uh, stony path, that, and I think a lot of comedy, in the, comedy producers in the room will bear me out on that, that for a period of time, Channel 4 and the BBC were the only people really investing in comedy because it is incredibly hard to get right. It's an expensive genre, it's difficult to land, and for a commercial channel, sometimes it just doesn't make financial sense. So it is certainly true that, you know, to have great comedy and entertainment hits in the mix is vitally important, but they are hard to find. Yeah. And they're also very hard to define, aren't they? I mean, if you talk to people who make comedy, I don't, I don't know how, how you work. Do you tend to say to them, I'm looking for something that goes like this? Or do you say to them, you know what, I'll know it when I see it and it makes people laugh? Well, I think, you know, I think at the end of the day, what we're looking for is comedy that it, right across the spectrum, whether it's the more niche pieces that we do that we know will be much harder to get a large audience to, or whether it's something like Friday Night Dinner, which can quite happily sit in the heart of the schedule on Channel 4 and deliver a large audience. I think we are we remain a terrestrial channel. We're not a niche player, so mm. we're looking for comedy right across that spectrum. Um, Home for the Holidays, that was broadcast in the run-up to Christmas. Mm -hmm. It was criticised for some people by some people for being, they said, about as festive as psycho. What, what, were, you what were you trying to do with that programme? I think at, the, at its heart was a really interesting insight about how problematic it is. It's a very universal experience for an awful lot of people that going home at Christmas is difficult, and that was the kind of core insight. I don't think we did a fantastic job with it, and I think at the end of the day, we've tried lots of entertainment over the past year. Some's worked, some hasn't worked. It's been very striking to me. That's also been true across the whole of the broadcaster picture. It, entertainment is tough, and people are struggling to find great hits. But then, you know, I sit here now, one year on, thinking if you ask the question who won the RTS and the BAFTA for entertainment last year, I don't think most people would realise it was Channel 4, but it was for Darren Brown, the experiment. So yes. I think what we're continuing to do is say we're not in the business of shiny floor shows, we're not doing that sort of thing, but we are inventing different sorts of shows. It was a very good year for you, awards-wise. How many yeah. BAFTAs and how many RTS, can you remember? I, don't, I mean, I think that might be a bit of an odd person if I carried that around in my head, but lots. Yeah, it was. It was a yeah. lot. I mean, do, do the awards matter to you? You... Well, I mean, you know, yes and no. I mean, it's nice, it's nice to get that sort of recognition for what mm. the team has achieved creatively. I mean, certainly the night of the RTS was fantastic because of the sheer range of what we've won for. To get recognition for a project like Mummifying Alan right through to daytime shows like Deal or No Deal Live shows that, you know, to be blunt, creative renewal is alive and well. We're, we're making the sorts of shows that are getting that level of criti critical recognition and we're growing a new generation of hits and that's what we're there to do. So... In that sense, yeah, of course it's great. Somebody just told me in my ear, I've got this earpiece that keeps falling out, which I'm sure you know, it's five BAFTAs and ten RTS awards. Excellent. Very that's, well that's, done, everybody. That's pretty good, isn't it? Um, the Mad Bad Ad show didn't win one of those. Um, it was pulled after three episodes. What was it that went wrong? It wasn't pulled. Uh, it moved to a different slot. It wasn't pulled, actually. All the episodes went out. I mean, I think... Where did it move from to? It moved from Thursday to Friday. No, we're very controversial. Um, I think... No, but it, it presumably it moved in its timings in the schedule. Well, yeah, but... By 20 minutes or I can't remember exactly, Kirsty, but my point is, at the end of the day, with shows like that, they're incredibly hard to get right. Yeah. We experimented. I don't think we did a great job with it, and I think everyone involved in it knows that. But as I say, it's not as though we've got all other broadcasters, you know, knocking it out of the ballpark and having a whole succession of entertainment hits. It's very hard to get entertainment right, and I think it is absolutely right for Channel 4 to try different things, and we will. Um, Million Pound Drop is a very sort of slick and involving show, I think. Uh, do you think it's suffered from being stripped in the way that Millionaire was stripped, in that you almost, you have a finite amount of programmes that people are willing to watch, and if you strip them, you come to the end of that finite amount 
in far quicker a time? No, not at all. I mean, I think quite the opposite, actually. I think stripping is one of the innovations of scheduling that's crept in in the past few years, which can take something which doesn't feel like an event into an event. It's something we did with drama on BBC One, we've done it with drama on Channel 4. So I don't think that's true at all. I think Million Pound Drop is an extraordinary success story for Channel 4, as David was alluding to earlier, not least because of the amazing insight it's given us into second screen technology and to play along games. And we we had extraordinary success this year with the bank job online where we managed to make, alongside a show that didn't cut through in the way we wanted to, a compelling online game that has a massive following even when the show's not on air. So for us to be innovating in that space and really, I think, now becoming the broadcast experts on play-along games is a really exciting place to have got to. I want to talk now for a little while about your team, and I don't want to tread on grief that is too tender, but I know that Shane Allen has, has just left. He's, he was your head mm -hmm. of comedy. He's gone to head of comedy at the BBC. Still feeling annoyed? I'm not, honestly not annoyed at all. I mean, I joked with him when he, when he said he wanted to go that he'd gone from the best job in comedy to the biggest job in comedy. I mean, I can hardly say, having left five to go to BBC One, that I'm going to stand in the way of someone wanting to make a huge move like that. Shane is a top bloke. He's been a fantastic person to have on the channel. He's been there for eight years. He's done great work for us. We've got a, a, an autumn schedule jam-packed with comedy, with Friday Night Dinner coming back. We've got a new show called The Mimic. We've got our first animation, Full English. Peep Show is back. It's a fantastic lineup, and I think he's left that slate in a really good place. But one of the things that I feel really strongly about at Four is we have to get better at saying, look, come to Four, do your great work, and then more people come to Four. I mean, it's not the sort of place that you expect people to sit for 15 years. Yeah. That's not what we're there to do. We're there to innovate and to make a difference. So, you know, really, very best of luck to him. Um, well documented. There have been lots of changes in your team. Are you happy with your team now? They're all right. No. Um, <laughs> Sorry, OK, it's a weak gag. Um, uh, yeah, I think they're fantastic. I mean, I said so before. I mean, this has been a period of huge transition for Channel 4, and I think we've not only got some commissioners in place who've been there for a while and who know Channel 4 like the back of their hand and are fantastically talented, but we've also got new people coming in to have peers running drama and Damien coming into factual entertainment and features. He's already giving those slates a slightly different feel, and I think if you really are serious about innovation and change, you've got to sort of be serious about bringing in people who want to shake it up a bit and who see it in a very different light. Our wonderful new head of features is probably here somewhere, Jill Wilson, uh, came in the other day and said, well, I don't understand why we don't do, not going to tell you what it was, this. And I thought, yeah, good point. Why don't we do that? Let's do that. Equally, Dominic Bird sitting over there has come in and has got a completely different take on what we should be doing on E4. So I think a confident channel is a channel that's happy about people coming and going and welcomes new faces. And, and that's where we're at now. I'm going to open it to questions from the floor in just a second, but give you time to, to think about that and also as you're thinking about your questions, we're going to take a quick look now at what's up and coming on Channel 4. Well, now, if you could follow any of that. <laughs> yeah, apparently there was a terrible problem with the sound there, which you yeah. noticed because you know what it was meant to be like. I yeah. just thought it was being very creative yeah, and no, every sorry. so often there was a sort of moment that. of silence. So I'm sorry that that didn't look precisely as you wanted yeah. it to look in silence, but it looked pretty impressive anyway. I'm, I'm going to um, open, question, open it to questions from the floor now. So if you have a question for Jay Hunt, now is your time to ask it. And uh, as you do ask it, before you ask the question, can you just say... Um, where you're from and what your name is. There's a man right up at the back. I don't know if we've got any microphones up at the back. Second row from the back. Uh, Peter York. You said earlier something after the order of, we like to bash the establishment in the nose. And then you said you like to make trouble. You like people who made trouble. What I take that to mean is making programs that genuinely powerful interests, genuinely powerful interests, don't want made, and are very cross when they are made, and hate you forever because of it, rather than things that spur sort of taste and decency responses after the event. What in your output has lined up to that definition? I suppose this is sort of the dispatchers question, isn't it? It's the question. I think it's, it's, not, it's not a question. Oh, it's not? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. It's not a question about bad table manners, is it? It's not that. No. Um, uh, you're to, I think, do I think that we have a role in holding authority to account? Yes, absolutely. Which is why shows like Sri Lanka, The Killing Fields last year, or the extraordinary piece we did on the secondary ticket sales that targeted via go, -Go or the piece we did on undercover funerals went out recently, are very, very important part of the DNA of Channel 4. I think we are there to hold people to account. I think our current affairs output is extraordinarily successful at doing that. And one of the reasons we've reshaped dispatches is to make sure that when we've got great stories, we can get them out there quickly. And we're not sitting there thinking, well, this doesn't quite sustain an hour worth of current affairs. So I think it is an important part of what Channel 4 is there to do. One of the things someone, if I probably hear someone, someone once said to me, you don't want Channel 4 to be the kid at the back of the bus sort of doing this. And I think, no, you don't. We should be holding authority to account on big issues that actually have 
you know, are important and impact on people's lives, and that's absolutely part of the brief of what we're there to do. I was slightly underwhelmed. Now, I, to be completely honest, it was a slightly underwhelming question. I don't really understand. <laughs> um, it, no, it means that there are enormous lobbying interests arranged around the world that don't want things made. It's quite easy to identify what they are make great efforts to stop them being made and get genuinely cross after the event. Have you done anything like that? Yes, we've done a lot like that. Well, I didn't think I was hearing it. Love the channel, though I do. I didn't think I was hearing it. I thought they were in a lower key. No, I don't, I don't think they're in a lower key at all. I mean, self-evidently, my background is in news and current affairs, so that sort of core journalism, how we hold people to account, whether it's investigating Tony Blair's expenses, looking at the secondary anyway, ticket you, market, looking at what was going well, on in the Olympics. It's part and of the re it's, you feel it's part of the remit? Absolutely part of the remit. Good. I look at something, for example, like Unreported World that we still do, which we have a regular slot for international current affairs. The fact that we brought true stories back to the main channel, which had been, to be blunt, marginalised on more for. We now have international documentary back on the main channel as well. So that sense of you know, an international view on the world is absolutely core cool to what Channel 4 does. OK. Thank you, Peter York. Let's move on. A any other questions? Yes, one down the front. Simon Oakes. Um, two questions quickly. How much of your budget are you making available to drama this year and the next 18 months? And explain the, des the decision to strip Top Boy, which I thought was fantastic, uh, and very much was sort of got, went back to how I'd seen Channel 4 when it first started. But you decide to strip it, which is a risk, I think, commercially and artistically, because it was so well followed and so liked and so gr grew in audience share. The temptation to keep that going on a weekly basis rather than daily was a big one. Um, just like you can explain that. Um, budgets haven't been set for next year. I mean, the ambition is they'll be around the level that they're at here. I think the chairman is here somewhere, and I don't think I'll get the budget signed off in this forum. But I mean, so I can't give you that figure. In terms of Top Boy, I mean, again, it's, we hadn't stripped drama uh, before at Channel 4. Ben Stevenson, who's sitting behind you, and I, George Dixon and I stripped criminal justice on BBC One. And actually, that was a real learning for me about how you can turn drama into an event and really give that sense that you can't go out tonight because you've got to watch this. I looked at Top Boy and I thought it was an extraordinary piece, but that you wanted to wallow in that world. And what would really pull you through is that sense of drama as event. And I think the striking thing that that accompanied by the fantastic off-air marketing that we had really did create a sense of event around it. And you saw what happened across the week, which I think is almost unheard of in drama strips, which is the audience grew and grew and grew. And that's very unusual. So I think we were absolutely vindicated in that decision. You're right, commercially, uh, to be honest, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference because it sort of comes out in the wash. It's still four shows. They could go out of four weeks. They could go out of four nights. I think the much bigger decision is an editorial one. Not everything lends itself to that type of structure. It's not right for all shows. But I think when you have a show that has that sense of momentum to it, you can use it very effectively. And I think we did in that case. OK, let's move on. Any more questions? Gosh, very silent. Well, in that case, I will thank Jay Hunt very much for her thank time you. and her eloquent answers, and thank you for listening. Thank you.